My name is Renato Longato, I'm Peruvian, and uh, I've been living in the United States of America, in Atlanta, Georgia, since 1994. I've been involved in the ET presence UFO phenomena since I was 17 years old. So that was a bunch of years ago. Yes, it's 1979. First of all, I want to uh, really thank Francisco Correa, his lovely wife, Susana, his uh, sister-in-law, Fernanda da Silva, for all the effort they have put in this uh, conference. And it's going to be the first time and you have my full support, Francisco, for Exopolitics Portugal. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm not a member of Exopolitics, I'm a guest speaker. I'm an independent um, researcher and author. I uh, was hired by the Peruvian government in 1991 to research about non-traditional tourism. Yes, the government paid me to research about non-traditional tourism. In other words, mystical tourism, esoteric tourism, for one year and a half. So I was paid to travel the coast of Peru, the highlands and the Amazon basin, and have these encounters with real shamans, visiting hot spots, UFO power places, and even have contact with tour guides and other researchers to know and have real life experience. One thing is theory, which is good. The other thing is experience, practice. To have seen UFO sightings change your life. And when I was 17 years old and I was watching a TV show by myself in my home in Lima, Peru, I was able to have a UFO sighting that changed my life completely. Two weeks later, I have a second UFO sighting with my oldest brother while he was driving his truck on the way back home. In that time, we used to live in a suburban area of Lima. On the third time, two weeks later, I was in May 1979, we also have another third UFO sighting, a UFO, a disc kind of metallic shape, shining object. It was above our house, moving around in a pentagonal or hexagonal movement. And to make the story short, in 1985, I have an extraordinary experience, which is so also known as a close encounter. So I received some message and some information that doesn't make me special. I just have a testimony. I'm a witness of an extraordinary reality. And that's what I'm here, to share with you a paradigm. Paradigm 2012. I'm not going to talk about the Mayan calendar or any prophecies or predictions. I'm going to give you an interpretation of this extraordinary reality. A paradigm is a model or understanding of a reality or a worldview. It's trying to interpret that reality. It's not the last word, but it, at the present, it helps me to understand much better this complex situation, which is the presence of alien sophisticated civilizations visiting the planet Earth. And what they're doing here, why are they so attached in a subtle way with the American government? While many people are asking about conspiracy theories, you know, to know about what's happened with HARP and other uh, uh, viral information that it practically confuse people. This is, it. this is the time and the moment we have to give some information for you to think, not to convince anybody, just to make you think the possibility, the greatest possibility, almost impossible and unthinkable, that alien sophisticated civilizations are visiting us here on Earth because there is something else which is going to come in the next years in the future. Within time, we will find out more information. Information will re reveal us a new perspective, a new worldview, and we will have a different awareness, which is going to make us understand the future possibilities, infinite possibilities that humankind can have. So this is an interpretation only. So we're going to have a brainstorm kind of uh, conference, Paradigm 2012. In 1947, 1947 is a special uh, uh, year. 
because in that time, in 1947, June 24th, 1947, Kenneth Arnold have a pre in my opinion, a pre-coordinated encounter in June 24th, 1947. Kenneth Arnold was a businessman, was a person of impeccable records, and later he, became a, he was a congressman for the United States of America. He was a person who coined the term flying saucer. We never before have the idea of UFO, unidentified, unidentified flying objects. But the term to have in mind a, a, a picture of a flying saucer came from Kenneth Arnold. While he was uh, uh, flying his Piper uh, plane in 1947 near Mount Rainier in Washington State, not Washington DC, Washington State in the northern west coast of the United States. He was able to see a fleet of look like flying saucers. When he landed, all the information became hot and all the press and the radio in that time decided to spread the news that someone, for the very first time, says, I've seen flying saucers. From now on, it started a new modern era of ufology, 24th of June, 1947. Then in July, just a few weeks later, 19, June, July 7, 1947, it was an alleged UFO crash in Roswell. It has been, you know, talked by uh, uh, Paula and other of my colleagues here in this workshop seminar. Then on September 23rd, 1947 too, remember June 24, July 7, 1947, and then on September 23rd, 1947, the Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Nathan T. Twining sent a report to his superior saying that UFOs are not fiction or vision, they are real. So since 1947 happened this in a very short period of time, and there was a reason right after the Second World War, it happened in the United States of America. What I said at the beginning of the lecture is that there is a subtle relation with a low profile of ancient civilizations that have to deal with the American government through the decades, from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the new millennium. It has been evolved within time. And we pay attention to the parallel situation that happened between the extraterrestrial presence and geopolitical changes, social dynamics that have shaped the history of the planet, we will understand there is something going on, something subtle. We have to look and read between the lines. George Adamski was the first person who said that he had a physical contact, a contactee. For the very first time again, besides flying saucers that are real, you have the word contactee, a human being, a person who thinks and claims have a contact with an alien, with an extraterrestrial. According to George Adamski, in the mid 50s, he had a contact with people from Venus, aliens from Venus, according to the statement. George Adamski was a person very special. He had already a background in esoterics and philo Eastern philosophies, meditation, concentration, and all that kind of the practices that have to do with consciousness awareness. So with that background, after a, a years of preparation, he had this encounter in the desert in California with an alleged uh, alien from Venus that gave him information and predictions for the future. He was the first one, the pioneer of the modern era of contactees right after the Second World War, okay? Then we have another two more important American contactees, which I call Cold War contactees. In that time, the message was, we were on the edge of nuclear annihilation and kill or overkill the human race if we don't follow these indications to try to control nuclear proliferation because it will danger the species and human life on the earth. Just like that, human life on the earth because the Cold War mentality was a nuclear retaliation between Russia and the United States of America. We have forgotten many things since the, sec the end of the Second World War and the Cold War. So here we have on the left, Daniel Fry. Daniel Fry have, according to him, according to his testimony, a contact with extraterrestrial telling about technicalities the future of humankind, or how we also were on the edge of a nuclear retaliation between the two superpowers. 
a bipolar situation of two superpowers with different mindsets, different political agendas. Daniel Fry was also a top executive of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. How convenient. How convenient. Then we have Howard Menger, a guy who used to live in New Jersey, a regular man who was a TV te radio technician in that time, and he was able to invite even local policemen, doctors and psychiatrists, to see how he was able to summon UFOs and to record UFOs. Later on, he had a special work with the uh, 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 U.S. Air Force in the late 50s. And if you Google the name, and I suggest you to do so, of Howard Menger, and have this four-part series of interviews, in the last interview, his last interview alive when he was 80-some years old, he says, they told me, and that video was recorded around the mid-80s, late-80s, his last videos, his last uh, interviews, Howard Menger said, they told me they will be back in 2012. How convenient. What a coincidence, if you believe in coincidences. Betty and Barney Hill, the Hill abduction case in 1961. What is the thing very uncommon of this case? It's the first known abduction case in the history. First you have, you know, the one who coined the term flying saucer in the 24th of June 1947 by Kenneth Arnold. Then you have, in the seven, July 7th, 1947, the alleged UFO crash in Roswell. Then you have George Adansky, the first contactee in the early 50s. Then you have uh, 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 Howard Menger and Daniel Fry, the Cold War contactees, trying to tell the testimony that we have to be careful not to play with nuclear bombs. Of course, contactees were not the only ones. Bertrand Russell and other scientists and philosophers and people who were intellectuals in that time were telling about the dangers of nuclear proliferation. Not only contactees, of course. But here we have, in 1961, the beginning of the 60s, very important decade in the United States and in the Western world, you have a biracial couple being abducted. Now, if we think a little bit, why? From millions of Caucasians of white people married in that time, the extraterrestrials decided to choose a biracial couple. Why? In that time, the population of the United States was 180 million people, plus people. Now it's 325 million plus people. So one couple, every 1,200 inhabitants were biracial. And this happened in the northern east coast. In that time, what was happening in that time in American society? The civil rights movement with Martin Luther King. What else happened in 1961? If you want to know between the lines. Barack Obama was born for another biracial couple. Isn't that interesting? Do you think there's something going on in between the lines? Let's go back. For the very first time, the term abductees were in the nomenclatura in the world of the ufology, contactees, flying saucers, abduction. In 1964, all the research by, done by psychologists and psychiatrists about the regression, the hypnotic therapy that they have to follow because they had terrible nightmares, they had missing time, and they were validated. That was in 1964 when it was done. And for the very first time, even they were able to have a TV show in that moment, if I'm not wrong, a film, a local film done by a, 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 a producer in Hollywood, and it was released on American TV stations about this, the Batty Burning Hill story. So everything went into the mass media to educate people that they were capable to have this experience. Incredible experience, unbelievable, unthinkable experience about abductions. Who would have imagined that? A couple abducted by aliens and being, you know, tested with medical instruments, capable to remember places even in the cosmos and said, according to the testimony of B uh, Betty Hill, that they came from Zeta Reticuli constellation, according to her. She even had this information, 1961. In the same year, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King excuse me, was the leader of the civil rights movement in the moment of full apartheid in the United States of America. 
In that same year, another biracial couple have a baby, Barack Obama, the future president of the United States. Then we have forgotten the good research then, then, uh, done by Paula Harris about the problem with nukes and missiles have also revived the old story that we can kill ourselves. We have forgotten the Cuban crisis missile that happened in the 60s. You read the biography of the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense under JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and then by uh, 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 Lyndon B. Johnson, you will remember that we were close in 72 hours on a 13-day crisis to kill ourselves. But we have forgotten about that. That was happening in the 60s. People who were in that time in the 60s, you know, would have remembered how in that time in the United States, the children were taught and trained to be under the desk in the case of a nuclear explosion. If that would have helped to be under the desk after a nuclear explosion. But that was the time. If that wouldn't happen, Cuba would be, you know, wiped out. Part of the north of Mexico and Florida would have been right now a complete contaminated area. And the rest of the other Latin countries and the United States contaminated for decades. History would have changed completely. Perhaps we would have learned more things. But for some reason, it didn't happen. So we have forgotten that the mindsets of the Cold War when Nikita Khrushchev, what the General Secretary of the Communist Party was thinking, that John Fisher Kennedy was a person completely out of touch, spoiler rich man, incapable to have pants and to confront the Russian Revolution of the USSR, the former Soviet Union. John Fisher Kennedy was thinking at the same time, I don't think that Nikita Khrushchev would be so stupid to transfer, transfer and transport nuke missiles into Cuba to try to attack us in Florida. It's impossible, but it happened. And if you Google the information of Robert McNamara in his testimony, you know, the, the fog of war, the fog of war, he will declare Kennedy, Fidel Castro, and Nikita Khrushchev were intelligent, rational people. And he's made like this. We were close like this to kill ourselves. Intelligent, rational people with mindsets, with world worldviews completely different, could have killed all of us. And the rest of the country who had nothing to do with the Cold War would have paid the consequences. We were very close, but we have forgotten. We have forgotten about that. It's not good. We have always to remember history. And it was under cosmic surveillance because the clap, the clap of atomic weapons increased with France in the 1965 round, then in 1962 with China, and then we have something else besides atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs. How magnificent. We're so intelligent. We have a new super invention, hydrogen bombs. So according to this perspective, according to this paradigm, there was a cosmic surveillance to try to find out why USA, USSR, England have nukes and hydrogen bombs France in 1960 and China in 1964, excuse me. It created a potential scenario for total annihilation of the human race and balance of power and conflicts. On March 17, 19, 1967, as Paula said, the secret Monstrum base with 20 missiles was shut down after a UFO was seen and told by Captain Robert Salas. You have to go to Paula Harris' website and she have a full interview of Captain Robert Salas, who is a hero because he's telling the truth, that they were close also to find out how a technology and no human intelligence was capable to shut down minute men missiles at their will in a secret base. That means they should know also about Chinese missiles, Russian missiles, British missiles, France missiles, Chinese missiles, and being capable to give, send a signal. That's to send a signal to the world to the military and political elite and said, we can shut down your missiles anytime we want. That's the message. They're not playing. According to our worldview and rationality, they're thinking, oh, they stop that. Why? Because there was, a couple of years ago, in 1963, we almost killed ourselves. Said, so, slow down, you're going too far. 
you are increasing the potential scenario of nuclear annihilation because of your mindsets. It's here, it's how you see and interpret reality, as Pepon said earlier. For so what you see is what you create. So it all depends how is our world worldview. In the 60s, we have a decade of great social and political changes. Among others, the American society started to experiment with LSD and other drugs to have expansion of consciousness. In that, also in the, in the 60s, the uh, 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 meditation, the, uh, transcendental meditation, you know, started to become known as an activity of meditation from India came all these gurus. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada with the Krishna movement moved to San Francisco, especially in all the flower power movement. And they gave all this information and people started to try to practice Ayurvedic, vegetarianism, try to practice meditation. That happened in the 60s. It was a cultural revolution. Revolutions change when there's cultural. So our worldview changed when there's a cultural revolution. How we see the society, how it affects our culture, it can be changed. But it can be changed for good or for bad. We have to be always careful. So also in that time, Eastern philosophers were introduced in the United States. Carlos Castaneda became the godfather of the New Age movement. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Martin Luther King were assassinated. Dr. Frank Drake, which has been also mentioned in previous lectures, have this famous equation to see the potential of life in the universe. The Telstar satellite, first live broadcasting, that means now we're doing this through the internet. Soon you can go and download all this information of this, this in a few decades, all these changes through the technology. But everything started also in the 60s with the Telstar satellite, first live broadcasting. Then also started the China Cultural Revolution, how China has changed lately. It has become a hybrid, a communist capitalist country. Never before expected. Not even Mao Zedong thought it was going to change this way. Yuri Gagarin orbit the Earth. And then we have the first man on the moon. And the last, very important, last oil super reservoirs is discovered in Saudi Arabia. And that was in 1968. Since then, there is no great super oil reservoirs in the world. And according to some, the oil is decreasing. We're entering an undulating plateau of oil depletion, and that will affect our lifestyle. Not the gold, not the dollar. It's less oil. That's what everything is rising. Three cents per week is the gallon increase in the United States. Three cents per week. So when I come back to the United States, it's going to be more expensive. Therefore, the food. Therefore, the transportation, therefore, the medicine, and therefore, all the other products as a result of petrochemicals or hydrocarbon products. Everything is back like that because we depend on that kind of energy. So the revolution of new energy could be the solution. It depends also what kind of problems it's going to bring. So that depends on how we assess these new realities, these new possibilities. So the 60s was a cultural revolution never experienced before. And it happened in the United States and it is present in the Western countries. What happened in the 70s? This is very interesting. In the 70s, we have groups that were created by interaction with extraterrestrials exactly in the beginning of the 70s. We have here Jean-Claude Borillon in 1973 who alleged uh, says and claims that he had an encounter in the French Alps with extraterrestrials that told him they were the Elohim, the God's creator, the genetic manipulators of the DNA of the human beings. If after that he became Rael and the Raeli movement, that's part of the human experience. No one, no, no one before can claim that there is a manual or, 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 or a book how to manage that extraordinary experience because it's new. Perhaps the extraterrestrials of today's were the angels of the ancient past in certain biblical or divine books. So we have Jean-Claude Borillon in 1973 in France claiming that he had a contact, he became a contactee. Then we have Enrique Castillo Rincón, as Paola said, 
the ET phenomenon no, is not an American phenomenon, it's not a Japanese phenomenon, it's not a Mexican phenomenon, it's not a Portuguese phenomenon. It is a worldwide, it's a global phenomenon. Enrique Castillo Rincón was one of the few people who have witnesses and even presented records to the United States that it was real, his contacts, his contacts were real. Then we have Edgar Billy Mayer in 1975, excuse me, the Rama Group in 1974, which I used to belong after my experiences. I became a member of the Rama Group in that time. Travis Walton, the famous abductee, Fire in the Sky, the famous documentary of Travis Walton with plenty of witnesses and records, medical records, police records that he was abducted and later found in the middle of a highway, completely traumatized. That happened in the first five years of the 70s. So according to this, if we understand that the extraterrestrials are cosmic anthropologists, these contactees are the best way to be guinea pigs to find out how society react through people who claim to have extraordinary experiences and contact with extraterrestrials. How we find out unless we create the scenario for a potential contact with ourselves, the extraterrestrials, with a human being, and then send them to the society. Let's see what happened. What happened is his relationship with his family. What's happening in his workplace? What happened with the people who follow certain religion? How is he gonna do? Is he going to increase and put it glorified in his story? Is he gonna tell it like it is? Is he gonna become a guru? Is he gonna try to convince people? Or is he gonna close and don't tell anybody because it can affect his job and personal relationships. That happens. So in these five years, in the early 70s, we have Jean-Claude Borillon again, Enrique Castillo Rincón, the Rama Group, Edgar Billy Mayer, Travis Walton. It's a sociological experiment, and they have the day after the effect. Let's say, uh, what's your name, sir? Your name, yes, you. Jose. Jose. Jose finished this conference, he goes into his car, start the engine, have a long way back home, okay? Let's imagine that for, just for a moment, okay? And then for some reason you see a light on the sky. You slow down in your car, you pull the brakes, you're on the side of the road, and then you see a UFO landing in front of you. You jump out of the car, you're all excited, and you see the door opening. And there is from the craft, it appears an alien and said, hello Jose, peace and love. <laughs> Then you're in trouble. Then you have, yeah, think about this. Think twice. Think twice. You have to go back to the car. You go back home and you have to tell the story. Just your word. Perhaps your wife is going to believe you. But this, your friends are going to change this. Something happened to Jose. Something happened to Jose. But that happened in real life, my friend, when it's happening. And I've seen that in real life. Because you change after an extraordinary experience. There's no way to prove it. It's your word. It's the way you behave. We have to understand this. But what happened with all these contactees is that created groups, contact groups, contacted groups, and they spread information from the 70s to the 80s to the actual time. That's what we have right now, conference like this. Before there were no information, practically none. No books, no seminars. No, you have to go belong to this American organization, MUFON, NICAP, and others as well, to find out information about Orthodox ufologists. But if you want to find out more information about that, you have to belong or have literature from these groups. That is why the use of ETs as cosmic anthropologists and use the contactee as a sociological experiment. And the day after effect is the next day, my friend, you have to go back to work. You have to pay your bills. You have to be a husband, you have to be a brother. Again, after that extraordinary experience, how did that affect your, your, your psychology? How did it affect your mind? It all depends on the relationship in your social environment. It's not the same that Enrique Castillo Rincón have from Costa Rica, and he's living in Colombia right now, have this experience because his social cultural background is different from Billy Mayer. It's different from Jean-Claude Borillon. And it's different from the Lamberjack Travis Walton. They are different because they are living in different environments to spread the message, to make the people understand that we are not alone. So that we, from that perspective, we understand this is a sociological experiment. In the 70s also, three decades before the new millennium, exactly one generation before the new millennium, 
Three decades before the new millennium, in 1970, M. King Hubert, the techno prophet, declared that peak oil production in the United States it was going to happen in 1970. He declared that in 1956, that the peak production of oil will start in the 1970. And it was confirmed by the National Academy of Science. So he became like technical or techno prophet. King Herbert. In 1971, Bretton Woods Treaty terminated by Nixon. Why? Because they spent millions and billions of dollars in the Vietnam War. And the Bretton Woods, the main terms and conditions of the Bretton Woods is the dollar was pegged or attached to gold. It's not anymore. Because that started the slow and gradual devaluation of the dollar within all these decades. And we forgot about that too. 1972, Francis Crick, Nobel Prize to decode the DNA and LA or gel. They created the theory, directed panspermia theory, also mentioned by Adria Garcia in the uh, previous lecture. What he's saying here, Francis Crick is saying in 1972, at the beginning of the 70s, at the same time it was all this contact is happening in different parts of the world, Francis Crick was saying that it is not a miracle. God did not play dices. These little molecules came by an extraterrestrial society and they spread here on Earth to for the primitive oceans and the future life. Because it can be a miracle, someone had to be sent. And I believe it was sent by extraterrestrial intelligence. 1972, Francis Crick came with this theory after a meeting in Russia with the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, communist version in 1972. So this is not just he just woke up one day and said, hey, I'm going to have this theory to explain how life came here on Earth. He said, after this research and meeting with all the scientists. So at the same time, the parallel, what's happening with the 80s, was happening also in the 70s. Then in 1973, we have the Arabian oil embargo, the Arabian blackmail. If that would have started or continued, excuse me, three more months, Jap the economy of Japan and Germany would have collapsed completely. For the very first time, the Middle East have a political voice. They decided that this not is enough about a political blackmail because of the Israel Middle East always tension and crisis between the Palestinian and the Jewish and all the stuff that we know for decades, never ending a story. The Saudi Arabia decided to say, well, we're tired of this. We have the oil, they depend on us. The United States consumed 25% of the global production of oil. So let's pull the cords and see, you know, how we can manage and negotiate under the table. For the very first time, we realized that there were fragile economies, that they depend, this giant, this country, the superpower depends of oil in the Middle East until the present. And what happened? In 1973, Richard Nixon launched the Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act or Independence Project to be free of the oil in the Middle East at the beginning of the next decade. In the 80s, we have this polarization. The United States and the uh, former uh, Soviet Union, they were superpowers. A uh, bipolar hegemony with clear areas of influence, you know, revolutions in Central America, problems with the communist unions, on infiltration, terrorist attacks, this and that, revolutions and also, you know, pressure from the soft power, diplomacy of the United States, and muscle power, intervention in other countries, the United States. At the same time, also we have the first alarms of peak oil. We have to look for alternative energy, alternative renewable energies. But we have forgotten about that. That's why we are here right now. We have to pay the bill. All of us have to pay the bill because we depend on the change of production of oil in the world. The Gulf War started also. Why? Because one day, Saddam Hussein believed he was Nebuchadnezzar, like the king in the Bible, and he was destined to rule the Middle East, and he wanted to invade, and he invaded Kuwait. The next victim would have been Saudi Arabia, and he would have controlled the whole area with a tremendous geopolitical power. He wanted to be, and to put on their knees, the United States and the Allies, and to control 
all the power and all the oil in that time, but he failed. We know the story. Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and it started a declining period, we know. Afghanistan is the thumb of all superpowers, according to some political scientists. At the same time, the UFO activity increased worldwide. It's always, if you look at the statistics of the increase of UFO waves, it started in the mid 80s. Very interesting, very casual. In the 90s, we have the Aquarius rising. Aquarius, you know, the only um, uh, uh, sign of the zodiac, which is with uh, uh, the body of a human being, you know, pouring water, knowledge. You know, we're in the Aquarius time. The information is given to all of us. We need all this information to uh, uh, become, become aware. USSR have a financial collapse. For the very first time in modern times, USA became the hegemonic superpower. Then we have this relation of the eclipse predicted by the Mayans before the last Ketun on July 11, 1991. It's a 20-year period from 1992 till 2012. The UFO waves increase in Mexico until the present. It's a proliferation of complex crop circles in England and the World Wide Web, the boots in the world, and spread also the ET presence like never before. All it also become a part of pop culture. It is and pop culture are shaking hands in the media, conference, and cultural presence. That means it's also present in our popular culture. The X-Files, let's put an example. The X-Files is very interesting. This science fiction uh, TV show that ran from 1993 till 2012 had all the elements, secret cabals, conspiracies, abduction, ET contact, psychic phenomena, covered up by the FBI. Okay, but what happened? What happened here is not Star Trek. It's not Babylon 5. They had cosmic adventures. It was happening here on Earth. Why? Because producer Chris Carter, the one who ran and produced most of the 80% of the TV show, The X-Files, used to go to this conference, used to interview all the contactees, abductees, and transfer all the information into the TV show. So what happened? that from 1993 and 2012, it became a global phenomenon, the X-Files. But if we look at UFOs and public perception, it's very interesting, UFOs and public perception, how media can change public perception. We have a poll in New Week magazine on July the 8th, 1996. 40% of the people believe that UFOs are real. At the same time, that the X-Files was very in high demand worldwide. You know, 29% we have made, believe that we have made ET contact. 48% in 1996 believe the government plotted to conceal information. Now, the next year, that was July the 8th, 1996, then we have the CNN slash Time Poll magazine on June the 6th, 1997, one year after. 80% believe that the government is hiding information about ETs. 54% believe the intelligent, ex intelligent exists outside the Earth. 64% believe aliens have contact, con contact humans. 34% believe aliens have contact the government. Because why? Conspiracy theory erodes the credibility of the institutions. Conspiracy theory eat your mind. So could be fake, could be real, we don't know. We don't trust the government. So that is what happened in that sphere phenomena, the social phenomena through the, through the media as well. We can shape the public perception. So in the 90s, I'm making a very short, making it this very short because of the time, we have geopolitical changes. USA, for the very first time in modern history, there was one superpower with the collapse of the Soviet Union. USA became the unipolar power. The rise of China and India, we have a future multipolarity, multipolar powers. It's the China and India are state civilizations, ancient cultures. While the United States only have 250 years, let's say, China and India have thousands of years old. They have plenty of information or whatever we can understand meditation, Ayurvedic, acupuncture, martial arts, whatever. These are rich in culture. These state civilizations are gonna disappear one day to another. They have been here forever, they're gonna stay here longer. 
So somehow the United States had to accommodate the power between the rise of China and India. And they had to be, and it's going to happen in this time after 2012, because we're living interesting times. Then we have the G8, the one who won the Second World War, as changing by the G14 and finally by the G20. The table of negotiations in the United Nations and NATO is changing constantly because we have the rise of the brick. B for Brazil, Russia, Russia, India, and China. They are demanding a place. They are changing things. And we have in this globalized economy that interdependence is very important key. Exclusion is non-viable. You cannot divorce the change of the globalization unless there is less oil. Because if you want to have fruits from the, uh, bananas from Panama or mangoes from Costa Rica, it demands energy and transportation. Less oil, more expensive. New economy treaties, unthinkable economic treaties are happening right now. In the last 15 years, new treaties are coming into different countries trying to do their best to survive and to cope these changes. Then we have the USA is in a position of the new world order. And I want to remark and, be, and emphasize that the new world order is not a group of people wearing black ponchos, you know, wearing black hats, meeting underground in a basis in the middle of nowhere and saying, we're going to change the destiny of the United States and the world just overnight. That happened in virtual conspiracy. And virtual conspiracy exists on the computer. Sometimes that doesn't exist in reality. So we have to be careful what we believe, what is real information also. Look, oh, excuse me. This is the Atlanta Journal Constitution. This is July 4th, 1996. In that time, I cut it that um, cover of this special report. Nations are competing for a stake in the last large oil reserve and the worldwide demand is escalating. Could this happen to us? And these are the photos during the Saudi Arabian oil embargo. Could this happen to us? Could be. Could happen to us again. All crunch in the USA. Look who is here. Richard Branson, right? The flamboyant millionaire of uh, Virgin Airlines. He knows about oil crunch. Questions and answers. This is a panel of scientists in the UK giving all the information to the government saying we have to look for alternative energies because when it hits your budget, things change. Things change. The old Dubai theory, it says that the industrial civilization can only expand for 100 years because if you need to demand and consume more natural resources, that also means contamination and pollution to have the lifestyle that you want to have, to be comfortable, to have everything ready to go, wrapped and packed with a barcode, and have everything right there for you, because we're a consumed society. And it says here that exactly, perhaps you cannot see it, 2012, 2012, the old Dubai theory had nothing to do with the Mayan calendar, nothing to do with predictions, nothing to do with prophecies saying there's going to be a declination of power because we cannot continue grow. An infinite grow is impossible because it will create an imbalance or maybe a potential ecological disaster. At the same time, here is without all these drawings, it says blackouts will start exactly according to the old Dubai theory from 2012 and beyond. We'll see. Now we're checking about the solar activity. Pre-Columbian civilizations have the solar cult because they, it was for them a source of life and it was misinterpreted by the uh, uh, former empires that colonized pre-Columbian and other cultures. The CO2 emissions are increased, the solar besides that affecting the earth, excuse me, CO2 emissions that we have in industrial uh, uh, countries and also the increase of solar temperatures are changing the environment. There is an erratic sun activity. The next decade, according to some scientists, will be, we will have experienced colder winters. There's gonna be geomagnetic storms already happening right now. The tectonic plates are more increasing activity. We have earthquakes like never before. Earthquakes like never before. And let me tell you something anecdotic. I'm a friend of Commander Julio Chamorro for the Peruvian Air Force. 
because I helped to release the UFO disclosure in Peru in 2005, and we have a private meeting in the Peruvian Air Force School of War. I coordinated that. Closed doors, no journalist. But the attache of the Peruvian Air Force in the Congress, the director of the tower control of the Lima International Airport, the civilian airport as well, and other authorities were present. And a close-up like this, we have all this information and release the UFO disclosure and the beginning of the uh, Office of uh, Investigation of Aerial Phenomena. I was in 2005, a year before. A year before, there was a, uh, 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 in the OIFA, something happened. Someone broke the doors of the Office of uh, Investigation of Aerial Phenomena or the Peruvian Air Force and took all the computers with all the UFO research information. Very interesting. We have the Carrington event in 1859 that they have been analyzed by the National Academy of Science because a geomagnetic storm can affect the GPS, can affect the satellites, can affect power. Then we have a cosmic Katrina that happened. Energy, economy, and transportation will be really in crisis. And the scientists are also finding that this charge of particles from galactic origin are affecting the sun, therefore affecting the earth, because we live in system within systems. And I think it was Joaquin Fernandez who said the Mariosca, you know, this Russian dose that you open, there's another one and another one because each system has turns and conditions. Solar system, the, the sun, the moon, the earth, we live in systems within systems. We have also, as mentioned by Paolo and others of my colleagues, culture, belief system, and religion. L'Observatore Romano, Los Extraterrestres, is my own brother. According to the, uh, uh, science, geosists and also astronomer scientists, uh, Funes, Dr. Funes, he said that. So the church is accommodating itself for the winds of change before reality gonna knock the door and say, you better change now because we do exist. And they know things. Also, the Nation of Islam leader, Mr. Luis Farrakhan, claims that he had an abduction. He didn't just woke up and said, you know, I'm going to call Jamie Malsang and J.G. Baer and other researchers because he had an experience. He claimed he had an abduction kind of experience in Mexico years ago. And his ministry supports UFO disclosure efforts. Do you see the mix of UFO belief and religion? That could be also a message for society because we're looking for answers. According to a Christian sect, tomorrow, it's going to be the end of the world. You've been looking at the, at, the, at, the, at the internet or watching TV. There are people believing that. And we'll see more when we approach December the 22nd, 2012. Because the UFO is a gap, a situation. Because we want utopia. We want someone to help us. Like Pepon said, we are the ones who have the answers. We have to find that. Who else? We're not going to have a cosmic abracadabra. We're not going to have a cosmic abracadabra. They're going to come down and offer us utopia. No. Jacques Vallée, the one who has done an excellent research about UFO, he said that sooner or later, the emotions stored in the UFO phenomenon will be released. What kind of social reaction will appear then? Each sector of society will react in its own way. The belief in UFOs widens the gap between the public and scientific institution. According to Jacques Bali, not me, according to Bali, he said that the scientific community has failed to the public to try not to understand or research in a coherent, organized way about the ET phenomena. That's why we have all this assault on the ET phenomena. That's why we have all these viral hoaxes. That's why we have all this information that makes reality and people are confused and others have their own agenda, I will try to use, to use that. What Adria Garcia said about the militarization and the space and also Paula Harris is because this will give the United States and its allies, if that's the case, full spectrum dominance. Imagine put satellites with atomic missiles in orbit. So instead to send 10,000 troops to Iraq, you just recalibrate the position of the satellite and you can send Fire from the sky. It's very interesting because the Bible said that in the book of Revelations. And the beast was so powerful, the beast was so powerful that he launched fire from the sky. Very interesting. I don't know. We had to check it out. But if that happened, you have full spectrum dominance. 
and they will change the geopolitical scenario in the near future. So something could happen between the religion, the belief system, and the UFO phenomena. And USA will have a cycle of changes. This is a good book about the fourth turning and American prophecy done by two authors, a sociologist and anthropologist from Harvard, William Strauss and Neil Howey, in 1996. And they predicted in 1996 a Muslim terrorist attack in the United States soil. No prophets. Just people who understand that every 72, 86 years in American history, there is a turning point. If we go back 72, 86 years before 2001, what we have? The recession. Then we have the Civil War. Then we have another aspect in the United States. So right now, the United States is going to experience a great social change, a revolutionary tectonic shift. A shift of consciousness will help to control the inner reptile, the limbic survival stinks. We have to have a consciousness awareness. Obama UFO disclosure, I doubt it. Obama has to deal with immigration, recession, unemployment. And Obama is also a meme. His own personality and background create a steer and the, the, the fear of the American establishment. They seeing him as a less American. Remember, he was born in 1961, okay? So this is a meme. Sorry, it took so long to get you a copy of my birth certificate. I was too busy killing Osama bin Laden. O o Obama has these two aspects. The president, at the same time, is a, is a figure of polarization in American society. George Washington here, the esoteric meaning, the, the esoteric message in the United States is the only one that has uh, uh, esoteric symbols in the most popular currency, the one dollar bill. You see George Washington in the cupola inside Washington, D.C. You visit the Capitol, you see the fresco of George Washington ascended to heaven, rodaden by 13 ladies carrying a sword, the maximum symbol of the 30, 33rd degree Mason. American symbolism, first Mason, first citizen, first churchman in a national cathedral, the statue of George Washington as a Mason. The great seal of the United States, the only country with esoteric symbols in its most popular currency, Novus Ordum Seculorum, New World Order. The new millennium, the ET presence that stands between skeptics and believers. They stand in between. Allow the skeptics to talk, allow the genuine believers to find out more information. We need to transcend the phenomena. It's not only the UFO sightings, it's not only the videos. We have to understand what are they here for, what are they looking for. The ETs are shaping the collective consciousness of the humans in order to reorient public opinion and avoid a, a cultural clash in the future. They show themselves, show, 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 seen by different people from different races, social status, and it's in the computers, it's on internet, it is shaping the collective consciousness within time, and in the near future, it's gonna be something normal. Then we have the ETs are the ones who control the contact. We do not. They have the phone. They can control that. We do not have the, con the, con the control and the contact. Whenever they want and they consider it convenient, they may knock the door of certain leaders on the world and say, we need to talk because this is go not, going, not doing well. And you need these terms and conditions. If you want free energy, you want that? Well, come here and we're gonna negotiate that. What about that? Basic interactions with ETs are increasing lately as a part of the human experience. ET present is a reality that is merging into ours. It's a reality merging into ours. It's a hierarchy. It's a system within systems. ETs are cosmic anthropologists. Thank you very much. Sorry about that for the time. Thank you very much.